Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. We're going to be in the Message Bible. I, I uh, use the NRSV quite a bit. I use the NIV. I use the CEV. I use the Message Bible. I use a variety of Bibles, and I, and I try to introduce you to those at different times and different ways. And many times throughout the messages, I'll even bring different versions of that in just for emphasis and, and interpretation. But this morning, we're going to be in the Message Bible. We're in uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Uh, I will just say this. Romans is probably the, one of the most, if not one of the, outside the Gospels, one of the most important scriptures and, and, and epistles in the entire New Testament. Uh, one that if someone come to me and said, I'm going to start reading the Bible, where should I start? I would tell them to start with Romans. And uh, Romans just a, a huge, huge text. And we'll spend a lot of time uh, throughout my time here breaking down Romans because it's very important for our spiritual journey. But let's go into our text this morning. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's ways of doing things. Sin can tell us how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we live any other way we want? Since we're free from freedom of God, we can do anything that comes to mind. Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But live, but offer yourselves to the ways of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives, you let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can read it, readily recall it, can't you? How at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different it is now as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise, a whole healed, put-together life right now with more and more of life on the way. Work hard for a sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. May God bless your hearing, understanding, and most importantly, your application of today's word. You may be seated. Well, thanks, friends, for, uh, again, the hospitality to be here. It's a privilege. It really is to to be a part of God's calling. You know, I gave my life to Christ when I was 21 years old. I lived a pretty tough life as a kid. I was raised by a single mom. A mom that, you know, was, was in a state mental institution in the Bay of Missouri. Uh, when she got out of that state mental institution, she met another man who was another alcoholic who happened to be my father, and I came out of that marriage. And at about the age, between age two and three, my mother ran him off. She finally just come to the end of that type of life, and she didn't want to live it anymore. And she just took it upon herself that her and I were going to go our merry way. We didn't have any relatives. I never knew any of my grandparents. I didn't have any uncles, didn't have anybody. It was just me and my mom. My mom gave her life to Christ as she knew Christ at that time in her Catholic faith, and she never looked back till the day she died in 2015. She was the greatest winner in my life. But the example that she gave me 
uh, show me how you can live and, and how you can be obedient, how you can have freedom and how you can have truth and live into that despite the odds that are against you. Being a woman that was married twice to two different alcoholics in the 60s, that, that's, that's a very oppressed and a marginalized way to live. It's, it, you are, as a single woman, put in a lot of categories, especially at that time. There weren't a lot of opportunities to do things, so she worked two or three jobs most of the time. So that meant once I grew up, and I, when I grew up in Jefferson County, when I moved to the Saints to Arnold, Missouri, you know, I lived in a, in a trailer park. We lived in the very back in the beat up old trailers. We didn't have any money growing up. I mean, until I was seven, we shared a bathroom with the lady next door. But when we got to Arnold, you know, we lived in the back of the old beat up trailers and they called us trailer trash. And that's how we grew up. But my mom was never around because she was always working two or three jobs trying to keep a roof over her head. And so I grew up on the streets and that started for me right around the age of 10. I was doing what I want, coming and going as I pleased. And it led me to a lot of dark places in my youth. And, uh, and I had a lot of challenges in my life. And, and, uh, and we'll unpack those as time goes on. But ultimately, I crashed and burned finally at the age of 21 in 1987. Uh, and that's when I asked God to come into my life. And I've never looked back from that day forward. And so God has had a huge impact on my life. And uh, there's three types of people that come to church, in my experience. There's those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who don't know what's happening at all. And I've been all three of those guys. I sure didn't know what was happening when I got here. I sure watched it happen probably for the first three years of my journey in my Christian walk. But when I got into the make it happen crowd, and this is really what we're leading into today, um, it changed my life. But I had to overcome a lot of delusions about myself, about the power of sin in my life, about what the cross and the resurrection really meant in life. I had to overcome all those things in my life, a little by little. It didn't happen in one big cataclysmic explosion. But over time, as mentorship and people discipled me and we started to walk through this journey together, I started to get free. And that's what this whole text is about today. How do you be happy? How do you be joyous? How do you be free? How do you really live into this Christian walk? And more importantly, why? And that is, that is what we're challenged with. Each and every one of us are challenged with this, uh, this uh, calling on our life. But, but all of us, in some facet, somehow, some way, have to work through these delusions that uh, get in the way. And so that, through that freedom, I, I, I answered the call of ministry. I started getting involved in ministry. And I've been involved in ministry for 30 plus years now. I uh, spent a lot of that in the, in the, the prison system. Uh, over 25 years I've been a volunteer in corrections and, and working with lots of hundreds of offenders coming in and out of prison, mentoring them and helping them get on this discipleship track and, and how to live into their faith. It's been an amazing journey. And some of those guys will visit from time to time as they come through and, and you'll meet some of them along the way. And I plan to return to that you know, part of my ministry as soon as COVID-19 allows us to do that. And we'll see where that, where that leads us, if it's at Volunteer or Potosi or wherever, maybe a combination of a few places. But that's a big part of my ministry. Also in recovery circles, working with people who have alcoholism and addiction. Those are another ministry that I spent almost three decades of working with people coming out of those, those places. So ministry has been in, in my, in something on my heart for a long time. And, uh, and I just live this stuff. I just love it. Um, long before I did it for a full-time vocation. I, even, I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. I uh, had bought businesses and I'd start them, sell them, buy them. And I did that all in the insurance and financial services industry. And I sold the last one in 2016. And in 2016, I just, what was I going to do next? The bishop, before he was a bishop, Bob Farr, handed me a checkbook and a map and says, we want you to go plant a church. But I didn't really feel called to do that at that time. I, even though I helped plant the word at Shaw down at, on Tower Grove and, and Shaw, I didn't really feel called to do that at that point in time in my life. Um, so I didn't know what to do next, and they wanted me to stay in the Morningstar family, and that's where I came out of, and Morningstar is one of the largest in the top 100 largest churches in, 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 the, in the United States for a Methodist church. Uh, and we didn't do that either. We ended up taking a call, my first full-time call up in northern Missouri, and Susie and I went up there, and we had a blast doing it, and uh, I was there a couple of years, and they said, hey, we really, we know you're, you're comfortable where you're at, but we really want you to go down and, and take over a church plant down in, in, in Branson that's 10 years old. And so we went down to Life Song Church and we spent the last two years there and had to do a lot of work at that place. And we, we poured in a lot, of, a lot of elbow grease and a lot of sweat equity and time helping that place to get where it needed to be. And, um, and by that, this time, you know, that life was starting to change for us. Susie's mom was starting to get a little bit more um, in need of us. Uh, I have a brother who had a stroke about, mm, 
almost 14 years ago. He's been paralyzed on half his body for the last 14 years. It's lived right here in Melville, not far from here. Um, and I've probably only seen him maybe a dozen times in the last five years. So really, all this stuff has weighed on our, our hearts for a big time. At this stage of our lives, it's really time to come back and be a part of this, our home. And so that's when we just made a decision that this is what we're going to do. And, and we put that call out and, uh, and said we just want to come back to the St. Louis area and plant a flag and, uh, and be here for as long as God will have us. You know, that's really the, the quest and the goal to do that. And so um, we hope to be with you for a long time and grow to, into this family and, and, uh, and just have a lot of fun and invite a lot of new people to follow the faith, to become a part of this kingdom community. It's, that's where all the joy is. And that's really what the gospel lesson today is at the, in, in part of the lectionary is, is all about how to carry this out, how to live this out, how to tell people about the gospel, how to get, help people fall in love with Jesus, not just intellectually have a rich experience, you know, but, but spiritually really live into this thing and, and fall in love with Christ. That's ultimately my goal with people is to help them really do this. But we have to overcome some delusions sometimes to do that. So when we made the decision to come, uh, the church didn't want us to leave. Um, you know, we really didn't want to leave those people. They've given us, you know, for weeks now, a warm send off. We've had a great time with those people. I've made a lot of lifelong friends and you will see a lot of them as they travel to St. Louis to come to games or see family here. You'll meet some of those people along the way. But we're here. And we've planted a flag, and we're glad to be here. And really, we're glad to be here with you. And we're, again, I'm, we're committed to being here as long as God will have us here, as long as you don't kick us out. And uh, we'll be here, and we'll have fun and uh, do a lot of great things. But let's dive into our text this morning. And the question is, you know, that I want to ask everybody is, despite your, yourself being claimed as a Christian, you, you call yourself a Christian, what are the things in your life? What are the hurts? What are the habits? What are the hang-ups that are still plaguing you? That you just seem to not be able to shake. That you can't get rid of. That just seem to hang on to your life. No matter what you do. And you're kind of embarrassed by it. You don't even talk about it. You don't even tell your closest friends about it. Because you're just sick of it. And you get to a point of helplessness. A point that you feel like there's no real hope that I'm ever going to be relieved of that. Because that's what happens to so many Christians. We get here... And we intellectually believe that, you know, all the stories in the Bible that Moses part of the Red Sea, we intellectually believe those things. But when it comes to our own life, when it comes to all these promises, and this, this whole chapter 6 is full of promises, we, there's so much of us that want to resist that it could really apply to us, that this could really be true for me. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and, it's, and this is the delusion of sin. Sin is very delusional. Um, and it can cause a lot of hang-ups. And the problem is, the longer you're here, the pride kicks in. And when and spiritual pride kicks in, it's really hard to come to confession. It's really hard to confess what's going on in your life. I mean, really. You might tell your friends at a surface level, but to really come all the way in and say, man, let me just tell you about it. Here's where I'm struggling. Because we all have doubts. We all have insecurities. And everybody sitting here has them. Every one of us. But when's the last time you really talked about it? And so it's, these are the things that plague us in our faith. This is why a lot of people walk away from their faith, because they get stuck. And it's the sin that, delus- that, that, that causes all this delusion. And it's easy just to walk away and, 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 and go a different direction. So I just ask you to think about that this morning, because the title of our message is Obedience, Freedom, and Trust. Learning that our job is just to be obedient to God's word. Although he gives us free will, gives us free agency, we get to choose and call it the greatest gift or the greatest curse, however you want to look at it. But we have that to choose how we're going to live this life out. But if we, or if you want to call it another term, call it say-so. You'll hear me say that a lot. We have say-so in our Christian life. We have say-so in how our lives turns out. So we have this say-so. But if this say-so, we put it in and say, we're really going to be committed to the cross. We're really going to follow Jesus' model, how to live our life. Uh, There's so much freedom that comes from that. It doesn't come from just standing up in church and saying, I'm saved, and yes, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, come live in my heart, and sing all those songs. It's it's important to do those things, but you have to live this stuff out. There's so many people I've watched in churches multiple times in a year come up and recommit their life to Christ over and over and over again because they say the words, they intellectually got an idea, but spiritually they're completely bankrupt. So how do you live into this stuff? And a lot of it's unpacking these delusions that we get stuck into. Uh, the book of Romans teaches us about the depravity of humankind. I mean, that's what the whole book's about, the depraved soul of the humankind. It's irrevocably, helplessly lost. That is humankind as we know it. That's just the way it is. 
then we must have the righteousness of God since we're not capable of bringing it about ourselves. So we have to have God's you know, interaction in all this to make it happen. The key words in Romans is deliverance, is salvation, which means deliverance, I mean, and righteousness. And righteousness is mentioned 92 times in the book in the New Testament, and it's mentioned 36 times in Romans alone. So righteousness is a key, key phrase. These are two words that you really want to cozy up to, you want to snuggle up to, and you really want to understand what they mean. It's really important for your Christian walk to know what those mean, and then to wrap your arms around them and just live into that. Highly, highly important as, as, a, as a believer in faith. Chapter 6, it focuses on what I call positional sanctification. And what do I mean by positional? It's that free will, it's that say-so that we have. We have to put ourselves in a position to live into this stuff. My old mentor Tom used to say all the time, when preparation meets opportunity and God does the introduction, amazing things can happen in your life. But you've got to be prepared for the opportunities. And so that's really what this whole chapter is really trying to tell us in a big way. And justification is the foundation that sanctification sits on. Really, really important to understand that. And justification is an act while sanctification is the work. And so what do I mean by that? When the moment when I was 21 years old and I asked God to come into my life, I was 100% right with God that moment. There was nothing from that day forward I was ever going to do in my Christian walk to get God to love me any more than he already does. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But, but maturity-wise, on a scale of 0 to 100, I was probably a negative number when I started my Christian walk. And the whole point of my life from that day forward, and the same with yours, is just about growing you know, spiritually, about maturing spiritually in our lives. If I got out of this life a 70 or 80, if I lived the life expectancy, normal life expectancy, I would, be, I would call that a home run. I'm never going to be 100% mature-wise, but being right with God, I'm 100% right. Really important to know that in your life. Because it's easy to come to church and have your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, your challenges, you're going through life, and you look around the rooms and think, well, these people got it all together. They're always laughing. They're always together. They're always happy. They don't have any problems. And so it's easy from a pride standpoint, and the fear and the pride get in the way. The pride says you don't have to, and the fear says you dare not, and you don't share anything. You just drag your 150-pound bag of stuff into church with you, and then you turn it right around and walk out the door with it, you know, hoping that tomorrow's a better day. Your spiritual life becomes your fingers crossed. You know, each day, waking up, hoping tomorrow's a little better than the next day. And it's really important to know that this is it's about progress. You know, we're never going to be perfect. We're under the perfect love of God, but this whole process of sanctification is a process. And we need each other to do it. You can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. We've got to be able to come together. We've got to be able to stick together. We've got to be able to discipleship together, learn together, love one another, and do life together. And that's what it means to be in the kingdom. And that's what it means to live the kingdom life. Really, really important in our way we live our life. So justification, again, you know, makes us 100% right with God. It removes our guilt, but it does not change our life. It's up to us to live into that, and we're given a choice. If not, we would be robots. But God is genuine, and for love to be genuine, there has to be some free agency, and he gives us that free agency to choose how we're going to live our life. But what happens is with sin is that we can be stuck, and we can be conditioned, and you get conditioned to this point of helplessness. You get conditioned to this point of hopelessness. And even though you're coming to church, even though you're going through the motions, you can still feel pretty helpless and pretty hopeless in your walk, whether it's mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or even physically. All those things combined, it can really put you in a state of paralysis and leave you stuck. And so we don't want to uh, leave you there. God saved us by faith, but we have to learn to live by faith. And many of us, including this poor preacher, have trusted him for salvation, but are we trusting him with our daily living? That's the challenge that we all got to ask ourselves. Do we really trust God for our daily living? Because we're called to live by faith. Many of us intellectually believe, but we're spiritually bankrupt, and we don't want that to be you. Is this going to work for me? All right. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go to that. It's a picture of a German shepherd, obviously. And uh, I just want to share an illustration with you that really makes this point. In this best-selling book called Essentialism, Arthur Greg McGone described how we develop a sense of what is called learned helplessness. 
The phrase comes out of a classic work of, of Martin Seligman and Steve Mayer, who were conducting experiments on German shepherds. They divided the dogs into three groups. The dogs in the first group were placed in a harness and they were administered electric shock. Not nothing that was gonna kill them, but just a shock. And they were also given a lever that they could press, not with their paw, they couldn't do this with their paw, but that they could press with their paw to shut it off and make it stop. The second group were put into an, in another department, put on the same thing, given that electric shock, but their button didn't work. So no matter what they did, the shock just continued. And then the last group of shepherds were put into a group and they had the harness on, but there was no electrical shock whatsoever. So that's how they conditioned these dogs. And then they took these dogs and they put them into a large area with a small divider. And this divider had shock to it and this divider didn't. And the ones that either had the ability to shut the power off, shut the shock off, or didn't have any at all, easily stepped over the divider and got over where there was no shock. But the other dogs, the ones that hit that button and nothing happened, they just stayed stock, none of them stepped over that wall. They just stood there and they took it because they've been conditioned to be helpless. They've been conditioned to this is how it's gonna be and there's nothing I can do about it. And that's what happens to so many of us. When you see people stuck in addiction, alcoholism, pornography, going down the line, gambling, whatever, just pick something out of all the hundreds and hundreds of ways we can be broken and you get stuck in that. This is what I'm talking about. You get conditioned to a point of hopelessness, helplessness, that then, then I'm beyond help. Nobody can really help me get out from underneath where I'm at. It's like a two-ton elephant sitting on, your, on top of you, and it becomes very, very challenging. And so that's really what I want to lean in today as is, is we really bring this in on point. So I want to talk about the delusions of sin, and there's five of them. I just want to lift these up real quick. Number one is I'm not the problem. I'm not what you say that I am. It's to plague so many people. Pick a hurt, habit, or hang up. But that's what happens. You get somebody who's stuck on alcoholism, addiction, sexual addiction, money problems, going down the line, and you, and you try to call them out, and they're, they're just quickly to say, I'm not what you say that I am. It's not as bad as you think. And that delusion alone destroys a lot of people, kills and destroys a lot of people that are stuck in that very place with their sin problem. They just can't even get past it. Some, some call it denial, but it's really way past denial. It's really at a point of delusion and illusion, meaning I can't see myself for what I really am, and I can't differentiate the truth from the false. And that's, a, that's challenge number one with, when it comes to sin in our life. Number two is I can come to the room and say, you know, I am broken. I am fatally flawed. I do have this problem going on in my life. Yes, I'm an addict. Yes, I'm an alcoholic. Yes, I've got problems with this or that or the other. But, but it's not my fault. It's a fancy word called victimization. And it's a deadly place to be. And the problem with victimization is, is I can drink myself to death and it's not my fault. I can sit in a nine by seven or 10 by six cell for the rest of my life and it's not my fault. You know, you can just go on to the bitter end and it's not my fault. It's called victimization and it's a, it's a dark place to be. But sin can get us there. And it can really keep us there. And man, it's a terrible place to be. Number three, I am the problem. I can admit it. In fact, I know I'm the problem, and I'm responsible, and I take full responsibility for everything going on in my life and where I'm at today. But let's just be real with each other. I've been at this so long that there's little hope that my life's ever really going to change. So why even try? I quit. And it's called a discouraged heart. And once you get a discouraged heart in your life, you just quit. Um, there's an old tale one day that the devil had a yard sale. And he had everything for sale at this yard sale. He had it all laid out. He had seven deadly sins out on the table. Lust, anger, grief, sloth, going down the road. But on the back, he had something else. And a little patron that's going through everything says, well, what's that? What's that back there? Satan says, don't worry about it. It's not for sale. He says, well, why isn't it for sale? He says, just don't worry about it. I'll make you a hell of a deal on all this. But that's not for sale. And he kept pressing, and he kept pressing, and he kept pressing, and finally said, Satan said, all right, I'll tell you what it is, but it's not for sale. He says, what is it? He says, it's discouragement. He says, why isn't it for sale? He says, I went more souls over with that than all this other stuff put together. So it's not for sale in the story. And I'm just telling you, that's a, that's a deep, dark place to be with, with, uh, with sin when it comes into your life, that you get to this place of discouragement, and you just quit. Number four, as God doesn't approve to me, I'm spiritually disqualified. I'm suffering spiritual condemnation, spiritual persecution. 
God must have it out for me. How come things never go my way? How come I'm just, how come, how come? You know, we just go down through that road. But you really believe that you're spiritually disqualified because of the things you've done, the things you've thought, the way you've been. Who could forgive all that stuff? Who could just pardon that? Who could just be acquitted from doing all this? Who? I mean, in your deepest heart, to your core, it's really easy to believe that. And, it's, and what we're talking about today, you know, when you were made 100% right with God, that's true. But you have work to do. You have to participate in your own Christian walk. God will move mountains for you, but he's going to ask you to bring a shovel. And there's work that you've got to do in your life. And uh, it's a really dark place. And all these delusions that I'm talking about, I've been through every single one of them. And then lastly, I know I'm saved because of Jesus, the cross, and the resurrection. But what purpose do I really have for my life? And it's really, you, you do all this work, we do all this stuff, we live this righteous life, we do all these things, and for what? For what? And it's, it's a fair question to ask. Why do we do this stuff? Why, what, what is the, the purpose of all of it? And the purpose of it all is so we can become the men and women that God always created us to be, regardless of where we're at in life, regardless of how old we are, regardless of our past, regardless of how far down the scale our life has gone, where God created us for a purpose. Part of it is to make disciples. Part of it, obviously, is to love God and love our neighbor. But there's so much more to it than that. And what God wants to do with the gifts, talents, and treasures you have in your life, I don't know what all those things are. You have to live into it long enough to discover what it is. But it's powerful, and it's freeing, and it's beautiful, and it's the most cherished part of your life. The most satisfactory years of your life will lie in that when you live into that. But you've got to learn to live into those things one day at a time. You have to give into that. But you have to do that in order for that to happen. So there is lots of purpose for your life. And in your darkest days, whether you've been through divorce, whether you've been through cancer, whether you've been through a, a crippling disease, whether you've been through bankruptcy, whether you've been through addiction, whether you've been through an alcoholic, whether you've had a sexual addiction, go on down the line. You've been to prison because you've burglarized somebody, or maybe even murdered somebody. Regardless of where you've been, if you really heal from that stuff, what God's going to do with that on the flip side is bless a lot of people. But you got to heal from that first. And so that means you got to live into this thing. So regardless of where you're at on your spiritual journey, what I'm telling you is, and what the scripture's trying to tell us is, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. And that's what you got to have hope in, friends. you got to live into that. You know, I'm, I still sin today. But here's the difference between then and now. When, before I was 21, to sin was the most natural thing I could ever do. And it didn't bother me at all. It wasn't really objectionable to me in any such way. But as I grew in my faith, things became more and more objectionable to me. I, can look back, I can't look back necessarily yesterday, but I can look back in chunks of time, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, 30 years, and things, things that are, are way objectionable to me today that didn't used to be. It's because I've grown spiritually. And that's what we're challenged to do is continue that walk, is to grow in, in that faith and that challenge. And over time, we'll change in this new creation. So old, the old way was sin was the most natural thing I did today. Today, if I would sin, which I do because I'm a sinner just like everybody else, if I fall short, I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes me feel, and I don't like it. And it's a huge shift from where I was at to where I'm at today, and, it's, and that's that part I have to live into. If I went into Walmart and I stole this clicker and I brought it out to the car with me, there would be two voices in my head. The first voice would say, you're a rotten scumbag, you're just a lowdown broken dude you always have been you're a fake you're a fraud you're a phony and you know it we know it they know it so why even try and then the other voice would say Harold I don't like stealing which voice do you think is the Holy Spirit which one do you think is from the dark side you know and it's really important to discern those two voices that live and, and can try to antagonize us today so that's really, really important, friends, to, to get all that. And there's, there's so much to unpack in this one little chapter, and Romans is full of this stuff. But we created this for a purpose. And that purpose is to live out the kingdom life. And that's what I hope we all get to do together. I really do. I can't express what that's going to look like. It's, it's the funnest part of my life to live it out. And uh, we'll do it in a variety of ways. A lot of you are doing, already doing those things, but, but just we do it more collectively than ever before. But this is how this gentleman lived out part of his kingdom calling was something called Syndrome K. Some of you may have heard of this before, maybe not, but in the fall of 1943, German soldiers began rounding up Jews in Italy and deporting them by the thousands to concentration camps. 
Simultaneously, a mysterious deadly disease called Syndrome K swept through the city of Rome, causing dozens of patients to be admitted to Fata Benefitelli Hospital. The details of the disease are sketchy, but the symptoms include persistent coughing, paralysis, and death. The disease was said to be highly contagious. Sound familiar? But Syndrome K was different. There was no mention of it in medical textbooks. And outside of the hospital staff, nobody even had heard of it before. It sounded similar to tuberculosis, a terribly frightening disease at the time. When the German soldiers went to the raid the hospital, the doctors explained the disease to the soldiers and what laid behind the door for them. None of them dared go in. And that's how at least 100 Jews who were taking refuge in the hospital escaped death. Syndrome K was a made-up disease. The disease was created by Giovanni uh, Borromeo, the hospital's head physician, to save Jews and anti-fascists who sought refuge there. Borromeo began providing Jews a safe haven in the hospital in 1938, the year Italy introduced anti-Semitic laws. In October 1943, the Nazis raided a Jewish ghetto in Rome, and many Jews fled to Fanta Bene Fratelli, where Borromeo admitted them as patients. The refugees were diagnosed with a new fatal disease, Syndrome X, in order to identify them from the actual patients there. When the Nazis came to visit, patients were instructed to cough a lot. <coughs> and whenever soldiers passed the door, the ruse worked. The Nazis thought it was cancer, tuberculosis, and they fled like rabbits, said Dr. Viterio Securitati during an interview on BBC in 2004, 60 years after the event. How many lives Syndrome K actually saved is hard to tell, but accounts vary from two dozen to over 100. After the war, Borromeo was honored by the Italian government by awarding the Order of Merit and the Silver Medal of Valor. He died in 1961 at his hospital. He was recognized as a righteous among the nations by the Israeli government. So friends, that's what a kingdom calling looks like. It's to love God's kids. It's to live into it. And not for accolades or awards, but just to live the kingdom life, to be Jesus with skin on. That's what we're called to do. That's what I hope we all can do. I hope you all can just learn to love Jesus a little more, to love God a little more, I love your neighbor a little more. That's really what we're asked to do because we're a new creation, amen? We are a new creation, and we have to believe that, and we have to live into that, and when we do, man, it starts to materialize, and it's beautiful. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the Romans. We thank you for Paul's writing and what you poured through Paul. So much meat on the bone in today's message, Lord, and what you have us read, but help us to know the truth that we are truly a new creation because of the cross, because what Jesus gave us upon the cross. And through this new creation, you want our lives to be, to blossom, to be full of fruit to, for the harvest. But Lord, we know we have say so. We know we have free agency, Lord. So we just pray for the willingness and the courage to let our will be in line with your will. We know it's only when we do that that we do it rightly. And we pray that for each and every one of us today, that we can be a little bit more conscious of who we truly are, to know that we're fatally flawed, but that we are right with you 100% because of the cross, but you have work for us to do, Lord. So help us pick up our shovels, help us live into this kingdom family, help us live in this kingdom way of life so we can make a difference in our lives and the people about us. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. 
If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.org for more information and to give. We appreciate anything you can do to help. Hey, thanks for being a member of this extended church family. I'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of God.